Well, thank you very much. Delighted to be here. I guess you've all had a very long day. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm towards the end of the day, but I'll try to um, make part of the interesting comments at the beginning, even though there could be interesting questions at the end. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, IBM's approach to corporate citizenship and highlight some of the things that we're doing with not-for-profit organizations, public agencies around the United States and around the world that might be of uh, uh, relevance to the kind of discussion that you're having. And I'll start off with saying that, first of all, I was introduced as uh, an executive from the IBM company, but uh, I started my career in government service in the mayor's office. I ran a not-for-profit organization for a while. I serve on the board of a number of not-for-profit uh, organizations, including uh, the After School Corporation here in New York City. Uh, I'm on the board of the State University of New York. Uh, I served in government as deputy chancellor of schools. Uh, during the uh, early 1990s. So I like to think that I have a little bit of an appreciation beyond business, but what the world is like from government and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, so our approach at IBM is to start off with uh, that list that you see over on the left of critical issues, which my guess is many of the not-for-profit organizations represented in the room spend their life and their work life thinking about all the time social services, jobs, education, the environment, health care, disaster, cities, wh whatever the issues are, whether they're uh, served by not-for-profit organizations in social services or education or economic development, my guess is those are things that people spend their time thinking about a lot. Uh, then we take a look at what are the IBM technologies that we have that we think might be able to make an impact on that. Obviously, cloud analytics, mobile solutions, social, the Watson technology, which perhaps you heard about earlier, Bluemix, the kinds, the kinds of things that businesses are looking to in terms of improving their enterprise, lowering their cost, improving their service. So what we do is we take the technology, applying it against that issue, and then create a set of sample solutions, even though they're not sold. They're like products that a company would develop although they're focused in on corporate responsibility and social issues. I'll describe the safety net for you in a second. P-TECH, which maybe some in the room have heard about, IBM's Corporate Service Corps, our Smarter Cities Challenge, the work that we're doing with Watson technology to improve uh, teacher performance, our new health core, and apps for social good. So let me start off with the IBM safety net. I would guess that there are many organizations in the room who are not-for-profit organizations, and raise your hand if this is you, that have some contract with a public agency to deliver services. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I've learned all of my professional career is that that contracts process is one of the most difficult processes in the world that affect the ability of not-for-profit organizations to deliver their service. And it desperately needs reform, okay? Because the whole process of contracting out for service is based upon contracting out for product. So if you were selling the city or the state or the federal government pencils, you wouldn't need to have a process where you would learn about selling paper, you just sell your pencils. But if you're a not-for-profit organization and you might have a multiple set of contracts, that process in silos, contract after contract, service after service, is one of the most difficult processes in the world. The not-for-profit may be the provider of service, but they may not have the data that the public agency has, uh, and they may not have it to be able to look at, to be able to empower their workers to de deliver high-quality service. If you're a multi-service agency, that exist with a multiple number of contracts, having them each in silos is incredibly expensive, very difficult to operate, uh, takes an enormous amount of administrative time and effort, and uh, ironically deprives the individual worker of the time that they need to provide high quality service. So we've looked at this process, which by the way has 
Some people have made passes at, at it over the last uh, number of years, but no real progress ha has been made. So we decided to do was to create a software solution that would permit a not-for-profit organization to create a one-page solution to be able to provide a set of uh, services that an administrative staff person could have that would look at their contracts across a variety of different projects, make it easier for them to integrate the data, make it easier for them to report to a funder about what they did and when they did it uh, to be able to satisfy a variety of different audit and other requirements. And that's what the IBM Safety Net is about. It's not a commercial product. It's done with the idea that it would be something that we would be able to provide for free to not-for-profit organizations to help them to provide that service. So what are the benefits? It reduces time. Uh, it simplifies contract management process. It allows a not-for-profit to focus on what they do best, which is serving the needs of their clients. And the idea is that it ought to be replicable so that a variety of different agencies could benefit from that service. So we will devote the time and effort to develop this. Uh, we will begin the process of replicating it. We'll do some analysis about what were the savings to the organization, how much money did they actually get to reallocate into uh, needed services, how beneficial was it for service workers to get a picture of a community and an individual a client or a family to be able to integrate the delivery of service and then hopefully be able to save money, save, save time, save effort that could be put into expansion of service without uh, a whole lot of impact on individual agencies' budgets. Ultimately, the holy grail of this would then be to introduce it to the public agency to have them simplify the contracts process so that the safety net would be the platform that everybody would use. So that's an example of our approach to using technology, addressing a societal problem, coming up with a solution where it a product, you would sell it to somebody, but this is not about product, it's about a solution uh, using our philanthropic resources, and that's what the safety net is about. Another example of what we do is something we call the IBM Corporate Service Corps. This isn't as relevant to not-for-profit organizations uh, in the U.S., but what we do, it, I like to refer to it as a corporate version of the Peace Corps. IBM employees, we select 500 of our top talent each year. We send them out in teams to work on strategic problem solving for not-for-profit organizations in 37 different countries around the world. Uh, we've done about a thousand projects over the last six or seven years. They've been things like helping a uh, not-for-profit organization to be able to empower uh, small entrepreneurs or provide the management system for a health care program. Uh, all of the examples are problems that a not-for-profit or a government agency had, and the benefit is that they get a team of IBM's top talent to move into that community, live there for one month, working 24-7 to solve that problem. Were it a commercial engagement, each one of these assignments would be worth about $500,000 a year, but it's part of our philanthropic contributions program. From our standpoint, we also like it because it helps build the skills of our employees. Because if you're working to solve a problem in a team, working on the ground in Ghana or Nigeria or Vietnam, it helps build your skills to become a problem solver for your commercial clients. This is just a quote from one of the uh, participants uh, because when we do a survey each year, the people who participate in this program identify it as their number one leadership development program, more likely to make them stay at IBM and contribute at IBM, and 90% of them say it helps them significantly improve their ability to do their day jobs. And lots of other companies are, by the way, joining this model. We allow them to join IBM teams, send them around the world, so that they can understand that pro bono consulting and problem solving for not-for-profits is good for the not-for-profit, but it also builds the skills and the talent of your workforce, and it also helps you attract top talent to come to work for your company, because a lot of people may 
be interested in a not-for-profit or a social service career, and they may think that if you go to work for a company like IBM, you won't get an opportunity to do that as part of your day job, but if you come to IBM, you can. The Smarter Cities Challenge is a project where, again, we do it on a competitive basis. We select cities around the world, send in our top talent teams to help the cities improve their services. We just had a team complete its project in Rochester, New York, uh, looking at coming up with a better model to ease poverty. We had a team that worked in Syracuse, uh, New York, to look at why do uh, properties go off the tax rolls and could a city develop predictive analytic capability to figure out what to do to keep the properties on the tax roll. And in Suffolk County, uh, we helped the uh, county government think about a way to improve their water quality and uh, resulted in their getting a significant amount of resources from the state government to be able to do that. As you heard in the introduction, something about World Community Grid, but I would encourage everybody in the audience to find out about it. You can go to worldcommunitygrid.org and in all of three minutes, whenever you're not using your device, all of the power on your device can be combined with others, and we provide free supercomputing power to some of the most important healthcare and environmental research projects in the world. We have a project working on a cure for Ebola, and if you donate your cycle time, it can combine with others and provide the ability for the researchers doing that research on Ebola to benefit from a virtual supercomputer that will help them do their work. And as an individual, you can see every time you go on World Community Grid, how much, how much cycle time did you contribute? How many calculations were done with your time and your cycle time? And it's something that expands and can provide assistance to any important healthcare or environmental research project in the world. We're working on a project now using nano uh, technology to be able to uh, clean and desalinate water. There are a lot of researchers around the world who just don't have the funding to be able to purchase a supercomputer, but the World Community Grid gives them the ability to build that into their budget at a zero cost. PTEC, which you may have heard of, is an effort to try to reform how we organize and deliver services to, uh, in high school and college uh, to students in New York. We started the first PTEC school in Crown Heights in Brooklyn where students get an integrated high school and community college program and they're guaranteed first in line for jobs at IBM. There are now 40 PTEC schools across three states. In September, there'll be 60 across six states. And it is a movement that is moving rapidly across the United States to try to provide opportunity for young people. It's not a charter school, it's a public school, there's no admission, admission requirements to get in. It's serving largely low income uh, students, mainly students of color, and providing an opportunity for them to get an associate's degree, a job, uh, a 21st century job at a reasonably high wage. Our entry level jobs are, are uh, paid $53,000 a year. I know for not-for-profits, that sounds like an executive director salary, but um, uh, it, it is uh, the President of the United States talked about it in the State of the Union. He visited the school and said that this is something that uh, we ought to provide to every student in the United States, and I, I, I agree with the President. Then we provide impact grants. Uh, back in the day, IBM used to contribute uh, uh, personal computers to a lot of not-for-profit organizations. We're not in that business any longer. Not-for-profits ask us for help on strategic planning, project management, social media, uh, and we provide business process consulting to the not-for-profits to address that need. And as you can see, uh, this is how we do it around the world. There are about 450 of these grants in 2014, a little bit more in 2015. Uh, significant market value but designed to help not-for-profit organizations deliver a higher quality service, but also build their uh, management skills and their operating skills in the tech area and in other areas to be more effective and more efficient. Now you heard a little bit, I'm, 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 I'm guessing, about the Watson technology. Anybody in the audience know about Watson technology? Okay, it won Jeopardy on TV, uh, that was cool. But Watson technology isn't a game, it's artificial intelligence, it's data analytics, and it converts it into natural language, and that's how it won the game show. 
Now, using that technology, uh, we've been working with a number of cancer hospitals, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, to be able to load onto a supercomputer all the information on clinical trials so that a doctor diagnosing uh, cancer with a patient would have access to all those clinical trials on a handheld device and be able to use natural language to be able to plow that massive amount of data to be able to make a better diagnosis, a faster diagnosis, and move towards a better treatment plan. And it's actually uh, working, and it's resulting in uh, improved ability to deal with a variety of different forms of cancer. We're taking that technology and we're applying it to how do you improve a teacher's ability to teach? And again, load into the supercomputer all the information that you can gather on lesson plans, unit plans, in curriculum areas and in pedagogic areas and train it to respond to a demand from a teacher so that on a, a mobile device, a teacher would be able to say, I'm gonna be teaching a fourth grade lesson plan on fractions, can you help me? And then it will plow that data, give to the teacher the example of the lesson, give them an annotated video so that they could see it, and then respond on a regular basis to whatever questions the teacher has. It's like giving a teacher access to a mentor teacher 24-7, but it will never ask the teacher for the name, rank, and serial number, so they won't be afraid of using it and thinking that if I ask stupid questions, it's gonna hurt my uh, professional standing. Uh, the Watson Teacher Advisor, uh, we will launch in the middle of 2016. It'll be available to every teacher. It'll be 100% free. It'll be on a mobile device. And again, the more teachers who use it, because it's artificial intelligence, the more questions asked, it'll get smarter and it will be able to respond to those needs. Just like the example that I gave in terms of oncology uh, and, and doctors. A very exciting opportunity, a way of using the technology to be a game changer. We'll start off with elementary school math. That's, that's all it will do, but it will once it provides the teacher with advice on a math lesson, we'll then be able to offer, well, do you need help on discipline? Do you need help on assessment? So it will help guide the teacher to provide personal, individualized solutions uh, to the problem that a teacher would have. We're also lost launching uh, this year something called the IBM Health Corps, which will send out, again, teams of our top talent to work with not-for-profit organizations, governments around the world to address critical health problems. I'll give you an example because we did a pilot project in South Africa where the major not-for-profit organization working in, in the area of health care in uh, assigning medical staff around the country uh, needed the ability to figure out exactly where the critical needs were, what were the skills of their health care professionals to assign them and created an app that is able now to be able to identify where the need are and assign the right person to meet that need. That's an example of what a health core team would do. And apps for social good is something that we're looking at the development of a variety of free apps that not-for-profit organizations would be able to gain access to to improve their delivery of service. Right now, we've got an app that's being used by a variety of not-for-profit organizations in Europe to help in the resettlement of refugees across a variety of different geographies. On the app, it can help the individual staff diagnose employment uh, skills, matching against employment needs or healthcare needs, a, a matching against a variety of different healthcare programs. But the idea of apps for social good is that we would be able to offer this to not-for-profit organizations to give them the opportunity to gain access to a variety of different tools that would help them do their jobs more effectively. That's what apps uh, for so social good is about. And it will also use uh, some of the Watson technology. So what could you ultimately do? You might be able to help you know, uh, uh, not-for-profit organizations to be able to figure out how to plow a lot of information to provide higher quality services uh, to uh, people in need. Uh, it might be able to work on employment and training 
uh, issues. It might be able to provide assistance in economic development areas around commercial revitalization or industrial revitalization. And those kinds of apps ought to be able to be as flexible as possible, as useful as possible to the not-for-profit organization uh, uh, recipient, and able to have a replicable uh, opportunity across a variety of different other areas. Why does the company get involved in corporate responsibility in the first place? Uh, uh, first of all, there's a lot of people who think that this is something that uh, you have a responsibility to give back into the communities where you operate, but somehow or other saying it's just about giving back somehow puts, in my mind, a, 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 a small value to it. Actually, there is a real value to it, a real value to the company, a real value to employees, a real value to your investors. The kinds of programs that I talk about, uh, the uh, Corporate Service Corps and the Watson Technology and Social Safety Net and the kinds of programs that we're talking about, actually help you in the recruitment, retention, and skill building of your top talent. We're finding that the employees who are involved in these programs, thousands of them a year, are better skilled, more, promotion, more promotable, and create real value for the company. And they're more likely to allow you to retain your top talent and not lose them to a competitor. Second, because it's focused in on the core of, of, of product and service that the company makes, it drives your innovation and your capability to embed those technologies into commercial product. It's not that you're building a product, it's just that you're, you're building your intellectual capability. We, we win patents for, through these programs, we create intellectual capability, and we build the skill of the company. Next, it opens new markets. Why are we involved in our, all these activities in the developing world? Because those might be markets that the company might be interested in, and starting it through social enterprise is a way ultimately to convert it into a commercial opportunity. We're also finding that socially responsible investment funds are more interested in buying the stock of a company that has a high profile in this area. So we're finding that year to year, they're buying more of our stock as a consequence of the kind of work that we've talked about. And it increases your brand value and it provides real financial value to the company. And that's why companies ought to be involved in this kind of work because it's not about just giving away your spare change. It's about connecting to things that are real value uh, to your company. It gets a company an enormous amount of attention you, have, you don't have to pay for media coverage of things that you're doing that make a difference. We've got teams of people right now on the ground that are working uh, to address the flooding crisis in India and in Chennai. Now, eventually, people will write about that, and they'll write about the fact that what was donated were a variety of different solutions. We call them disaster relief in a box that help uh, deal with critical problems on the ground, and it'll provide people with an understanding about what a company can do. Now, is this only about IBM? No. It's about any company thinking about their corporate responsibility and their corporate citizenship effort as being something that goes beyond giving away what's least valuable to the company, your excess cash, but what's most valuable to the company, the time and talent of your best employees. Having been on the other side of the table, I don't think it's time for people to end cash donations. Uh, on the other hand, I think that can't be the beginning and the end of what the private sector can do for not-for-profit organizations or government agencies, or hopefully through tri-sector collaboration. So that's, that's really the message that I wanted to leave with you. Now, a lot of people think that this is, sounds innovative, it sounds new, uh, the, this is great that a company would be thinking about this. It's not really all that new. You know, uh, here in New York in 1946, IBM used to have its research lab at Columbia University and developed something that ultimately was called computer science. It didn't exist in the higher education sector. It was actually created by a company in cooperation with a university. And then over decades, 
it was expanded to the point where you could argue that it helped drive economic growth in the United States in the second half of the 20th century. That was a collaborative activity, cross-sector, to develop something that was valuable for a company and lots of other companies, but also valuable for community and value, value for uh, students and value for higher education institutions. Back in the 1930s, IBM worked in partnership with the U.S. government to create something called Social Security. The government enacted a piece of legislation. They didn't have the capability to manage it. It was a company that actually did the work, but it was a forward-thinking piece of legislation, and it was implemented through a public-private partnership. Back in the 1950s, IBM opened a plant below the Mason-Dixon line in Lexington, Kentucky in 1954, and it integrated the schools in Lexington, Kentucky. It integrated the workplace in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, and it was done in a state where they weren't particularly interested in this, but they were interested in the economic investment and the jobs. And those are examples in the past that demonstrate how public-private partnership uh, and collaboration and cooperation could actually address a societal problem and use the strength and the weight of a large company, its intellectual capability and its resources to solve a problem. So what I'd like to think is that what was done in the past was great. What's being done right now, I hopefully, is even better. And what we can do and could do in the future really would be to benefit this kind of work by a deeper and more sustainable collaboration between private sector, public sector, and the not-for-profit sector. Thank you very much.